and it was great because it's just the recording oh yeah so it's great too because uh like dr greg a lot of this a lot of the speakers were were there were there off and on but uh dr gregor was there the whole time even though he had the last lecture at the very end he was there the whole time and he was in the line with everybody chatting and you hear his voice you know his voice is so loud and identifiable and, and uh and so it's just it's just fun to get to to talk to him and just see him there mingling he just loves to talk to people and he's he's so genuine he's he's just loves people and just talking to everyone. And um, it was so funny for his lecture. They, because everyone knows he's like the rock star. So they actually played the, like the theme when he, it was pretty funny when he came out, everybody it was the, you know, the basketball. If you ever watch NBA basketball games, they have that, that song. <laughs> you know, that song, get all, you're, you're ready for this. Yeah. And so they played that song when he walked in. So it was pretty funny. Because <laughs> everybody knows him, you know. I saw that Luminaries live recording. Scott, were you there for that part? Yeah. Uh huh. That was. Oh, you ready? They they that made that available to everybody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you're, yeah, yeah, I get the emails <clears throat> from Plantrition Project, so <clears throat> I got great. that and signed on. And... Yeah, that's the one I took a picture of. That was actually Eric uh, Eric Colgrove took that picture that I posted on the on the Facebook group. Oh, I didn't. That, that was actually Eric's picture, and so it, there was four people and that were there virtually. So Dean Ornish, T. Colin Campbell, Esselstyn, and uh, let's see who was the other. Oh, Neil Barnard were there virtually, virtually. live though, of course. And then uh, Michael Clapper was there in person, and of course Scott Stoll was the moderator, and then um, Brenda Davis, the dietitian. She's she's amazing. Um, yeah, yeah. So that all they were all there in person. That was amazing. It was like midnight almost back east. And I was like, wow, yeah, these are amazing people. You know. Yeah. Yeah. It's a lot. It's a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. Anyone else have anything to share? I just have a, a question, just mm -hmm. kind of FYI. Um, what do you put on your salads? You know what kind of you know like vinegar or what well everyone kind of has a different dressing i mean there's i have the all the different dressings in the on the website but i i tend to use what well, home i tend to use it's a dressing called three two one so it's three parts balsamic vinegar two parts mustard and one part uh maple syrup so it's just a tiny bit so it's so three two one is the proportion so like i have this kind of bottle and I put, you know, basically fill it a, th a third full of, of the balsamic vinegar and then and then just a tiny bit more of the mustard and just a, the smallest amount of the of the maple syrup and such. So then there's no oil that way. And it just kind of balances out the the kind of the acidity of the balsamic vinegar. And because really all mustard is is more vinegar and mustard seed. And that's really all mustard is. And then, you know, just a small amount of the maple syrup just to kind of mild it out a little bit. So that's what I use a lot. But like at the conference, they had all kinds of dressings made from, you know, cashews or whatever. There's lots of great recipes you can you can uh, make that are oil free. Thanks. And um, I'm not staying on the. Were you finished, Dorothea? Um, I just wanted to ask what type of mustard is that yellow mustard? Yeah, I just get re regular French's mustard from Costco. That's, that's what I use. Because if you look at the ingredients list, it's just mustard seed, a little bit of yellow dye, mustard seed, and um, vinegar. That's all that's in it. So I was just going to say I'm, I'm not able to stay on the call, but I just wanted to share the link to what Charlie did on Wednesday with the um, folks for the um, nutrition and medicine group. And I just wanted to say thank you so much. It was for everybody who wasn't there, it was so amazing. And it was like 15 stories. And I see on the call now there's Beth and Evie and Dolly and Dorothea who all spoke and maybe there's more. Velvet spoke and Kim Clark spoke and and I felt like each story that was told just 
added another dimension and another viewpoint and and so by the end it was just so powerful um, and it kind of covered the health of people the health of animals the health of our um, earth and and it was what I really loved and thank you guys so much for like Dolly when you were speaking up it was this real collaboration between the healthcare providers and who are patients themselves I mean Scott and Charlie your stories and other people's um, just all like healthcare providers talking about the challenges that they face within the system and patients talking about how to overcome those possible ways to overcome and everybody kind of working together and it, it was so powerful and so Charlie I'm going to put in the chat box the link if that's okay of course it's okay Okay. And uh, I'd encourage everybody to take a look at uh, the link talking about amazing people. If you have a minute or two more, I want to read to you a note from one of the medical students from Idaho who's in the lifestyle medicine track. It's a reflection. She says, what a special opportunity to hear from a cornucopia of students, patients, physicians, PAs, parents, daughters, about how lifestyle medicine and more specifically plant-based diets changed their lives. I've been to many nutrition and medicine talks and have loved them all for various reasons. Yet this one really pulled on my heartstrings. To hear the Western U alumni talk about her father's major transformation was beautiful and inspiring. Learning of the life-changing impact she had on her father warmed my heart helped me reconnect to why I wanted to go into medicine in the first place. Our curriculum is so jam-packed with information and nonstop studying that I find it easy to lose sight of what got me excited about healing in the first place. Thank you so much for creating the space to present the amazing stories through nutrition and medicine and create an opportunity for us to stop and reconnect to the impact we hope to make as future physicians. P.S. I love that we also included students from Idaho. And I was wondering if nutrition medicine was something that we could share with other schools that have lifestyle medicine tracks. If not, maybe it's something I could share with the lifestyle medicine interest group network. So um, the impact is spreading. Uh, I again want to thank, like you just thanked all the participants. And for those who didn't get a chance to see that or be a participant, take a look at the note that Debbie's putting in there or the link uh, and view it. It's worth your time. It's, and I and I plan and I plan to put the link in this coming Sunday's group email too. It's two hours and and they flew <laughs> by. I mean, it was riveting. It was riveting. And there's I there's one more thing I wanted to say, but I forgot. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, just yeah. yeah, yeah, it was great. It was great. Yeah. That and was I, the other thing. I mean, I'm, oh, I'm looking forward to the next months, which are like Dr. McDougall and Chef AJ. And that's great. But I like that student have listened to a lot of those and, mm -hmm. and they're wonderful. But but the stories that I heard the other day, just, and I liked what Charlie said in the beginning, he could have just featured three or four, but he wanted a whole bunch to just say, you know what, for heart disease, for cancer, for diabetes, for thyroid issues, all kinds of things, the plant-based diet and lifestyle medicine really make a difference. And there were some phenomenal stories. And so, and, and we can go, all of us can go every month if we want to. And, and there's the recordings and, and uh, yeah, so oh, thank you. So much. <laughs> it's, it was pretty inspiring for yeah. sure. Yeah, we all loved it. Dolly, I appreciated your, there were a couple of people that sort of challenged the medical students, Dolly, you included. And, um, and just like, you know what? we need to be responsible for our health and you need to be responsible for giving us good information and, and 
good advice. And uh, so, okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Dolly. Yeah. And going off what you said, Debbie, too, you reminded me of at the conference. One thing I learned at this one that I haven't learned it, you know, I've been to eight other conferences, national conferences. I was just kind of totaling up since 2017. And what I learned at this one in particular was how interconnected all the all the people that have been doing this a long time, the pioneers, how interconnected they were. I had no no idea how much they had actually go, go flown out to where the other provider is and helped them and mm -hmm. how how they because one was struggling in one area trying to, to, to get things moving forward. And so then another one that had special T area in one area would come out and and help that person and um, I just that was what it was amazing is is how how much there was communication and interconnection. So that's why anytime anyone comes to these classes, we want to help help them any way we can. And you know, if if a you know medical student wants to you know shadow me or Charlie or somebody in the clinic, we we open we're open to that. So that just to kind of help help all those that are interested interested in this field to to feel supported and and we can all help each other to help move this going forward. One example, I'll just throw out one example that was, I didn't know, like, so uh, Hans Deal, who he's a PhD in, um, he has a PhD in, in health science. So he's not a physician, he's a PhD in health science and he developed the CHIP program. So a lot of people are familiar with the CHIP program. So he's been around forever, but so I, I did know that he knew Nathan Pritikin. I didn't realize I didn't you know realize to what extent. But then the other thing was so he he came out and uh, so Nathan Pritikin reached out to Hans Deal, and so they communicated. And Hans Deal went out to Santa Barbara where um, Nathan Pritikin was doing his practice. This is back in the in the seventies, nineteen seventies, and uh, it ends up that uh, when. Hans Deal came to interview some of the people at uh, Pritikin's program. He, one of the people he interviewed before and after was Dr. Greger's grandmother, the, who was at the in the Pritikin mm -hmm. program, right? And so I, so he he actually got to to interview her, and it, he remembered seeing her when she was in the wheelchair, and just like Dr. Greger said. And then he left, and then when he came back, when she was just about done with her program, she was walking and, and looked like a different person. So. Uh, so that was pretty cool. I didn't realize mm -hmm. that connection. Hans Steele was one of my first mentors uh, when I um, um, did training to teach the CHIP program. Uh, and we communicated a couple times together. He is the one who insisted we get this juicer so we could make uh, ice cream from frozen bananas. Yeah. Um, and um, he's quite the character and yeah. a, an interesting guy for sure. Yeah he, yeah, he was on the luminary panel too. He was, in, and of course was physically there too. So the CHIP program is a complete health improvement program and Dr. Deal put together a series of videos and and uh, I, it was a series of 18 classes and he went over the benefits of plant-based diet and how you can reverse heart disease and diabetes and kidney problems and had the importance of social connections but this class turned into a kind of a money-making adventure uh, I think the classes started out uh, when I joined on it was like six hundred dollars a class people didn't really want to pay that and that's when I started searching around, finding videos from Gregor and PCRM to be able to show for free, which covered the similar topics. And I titled the program instead of CHIP, I titled it TIP, T-H-I-P, Total Health Improvement Program, instead of Complete. I kind of worried that they were going to chase after me. And I told them several times, you know, you may not like what I'm doing because I'm doing this for free and, you know, you're charging for your program. And they said, no, no, that's okay. You go ahead and do what you need to do. And uh, we're fine. So that's how yeah, it went. Yeah. Well, a lot of it's geared towards businesses. So it pencils out. Dr. Greger has on Nutrition Facts has a video about it, uh, several videos about the CHIP program. And it comes out, pencils out cost effective. So a lot of employee health 
at big big companies will start a chip program and it actually lowers their insurance premiums because people get actually get healthier. So it's actually from a financial standpoint for a business, it's affordable and it actually is cost effective pencils out. But for an individual person, yeah, it's, it could be a little spendy. And uh, you're getting a chip program um, only more. You're getting it repeated over and over again. Uh, they do 18 weeks. But the only difference is they do blood work at the beginning of the class, and then they show you blood work uh, at the end of the class to show your improvement in lowering cholesterol and your BMI changes and, you know, maybe some, I don't know, whatever else other lab tests they do. It's just basic stuff. But the important thing is how you feel. And I think that you understand uh, eating more plants is a whole lot uh, healthier and you'll feel a whole lot better if you're doing that compared to animal products. I just had an experience. Go ahead. Um, Carol. I know I'm pretty quiet at the meetings. That's okay. I, am, I am listening. But I have a daughter I've been estranged from for a long time. And she's sick. She has been. She has MS. But what I didn't know was that she had been fighting for her right to not be given not to eat meat. And she's kind of always kind of been that way as a child but anyway long story short so I seen her I seen her again because I have my granddaughter and I had to take her to visit her mother and the condition that her mother's in we had to prepare her for but to my surprise my daughter is on a plant-based diet. And it really did surprise me because that is basically is what's keeping her alive. Hmm. Yeah. She, I mean, she looks, she looks very, very good. No, she cannot. She's on a feeding tube and she on a tube to help her go to the restroom. And usually people who are like that, they don't look good. Their skin doesn't look good. Her skin looks beautiful. She's she's tiny, but <laughs> I'm 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 I really am in shock because she looks very healthy. And she will not allow them to give her anything else. So um, if you uh, go to the autoimmune um, section of our archive classes, uh, we talk about Swank study and uh, that has been an ongoing study for a lot of years and how uh, Swank put people on a plant-based diet who had multiple sclerosis and they tend to have a, a lot fewer symptoms and seem to do very well in comparison to those who are not. So uh, there is something to be said for um, transitioning the diet, for sure. It, I know it is. That, <laughs> that has, uh, it's still having an effect on me now. This has just been in the last month, two months. And I've just started seeing her only four times that I've seen her. And I could not believe how beautiful she looked. Well, thanks for sharing that story. And maybe that'll be motivating to you to uh, do it. Um, to work know, hard. Yeah, to um, keep transitioning until you, to you obtain the benefits that you're looking for. But it was helping her daughter too. Yeah. Her daughter was looking at her like, it, it was for both of us, it was just, <laughs> mind-blowing well uh it's mind-blowing for a lot of people once they actually do it the difficulty has been is uh help getting people to actually do it completely mm -hmm. or at least 
almost completely if they have minimal problems and completely if they have major problems. Uh, and so we're gonna keep at it. And that's why we're gonna keep doing the classes. Well, so. I just have to thank you both. It's more than admirable that what you're doing, but I, I guess this, this really honed it down in for me. Well, thanks for sharing that story with the group. Anybody else? Any questions related to, to the lifestyle medicine? And I guess we had kidney disease before that, right? Yeah. But this is for time for you guys to ask questions and discuss anything we can show. I'm sure Charlie has videos we can watch if no one has questions. <laughs> <laughs> I do, I do have videos. I have a question. I would like to know if you would go, if I look on my medical record, it says that I have moderate um, chronic kidney disease. And my doctor says, oh, don't worry about it. It's only because of Medicare that it's there. It's not a problem. Just you know, be sure that you're staying well hydrated. But I hate seeing that on my record. And so just, you know, what determines, and I have my lab, some of my lab results. I know Charlie, you've given a lab result before that you say is what we should be, what is good to have. And I don't remember what that was. And just if you could talk a little bit about that. All right, the GFR greater than 60 is normal. If your GFR will marry a low filtration rate. If it's okay. less than 60, then your kidney stage, whatever it is, uh, of one A stage of kidney disease. Many people who I see are in the 40 to 50 range. That's about a stage three. Somewhere between that range is stage one and two. Uh, you might be just spilling some protein in your urine and they say you have uh, kidney disease. So what's your GFR? Um, the, they don't have a reading that's just GFR. It's an eGFR. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, that's the same one. It's sixty-four. So you theoretically are in a normal filtration range. So uh, if your BUN and creatinine, if they're normal, then probably what's happening is you're spilling some protein in your urine, okay. and they're saying that that is probably uh, it's sort of like pre-diabetes. Uh, you're, um, you know, at risk of yeah. having decreasing uh, kidney function if you're spilling protein in your urine. And um, so again, doing a whole food plant-based diet at this point would be the best solution to this problem. The other lab work, when I'm looking at the lab work with the results, the, the microalbumin is the normal they said should be less than 29.9 at their lab. Mine's 47.4. Yeah, that microalbumin is the protein that's kind of going through your kidneys. If you think of your kidneys as sort of like a strainer, if you strain flour through it, well, the openings are just a little bit larger. So it allows some of that albumin or protein to escape through. That can occur Sort of, uh, in my mind, it's sort of like people who develop emphysema or COPD, the uh, air sacs kind of get a little stretched out, a little floppy. It's kind of like a little floppy valve that you could get maybe, which could cause a heart murmur. And so, you know, it's, um, your doctor's right at this stage. Uh, you probably, there's nothing to worry about. Um, but I surely wouldn't uh, stress your kidneys by eating a standard American diet. No, no, I'm doing, I'm doing plant-based. And so is there, like with the reversing heart disease, they talk about how important the greens are because it produces the nitrous oxide. Is there any specific thing within the realm of plants that is especially helpful for the kidneys? Other than, you know, than doing a whole food yeah. plant. I'm not aware of that. Scott, do you have you heard anything at any of the conferences that any particular foods uh, would be just avo avoiding beneficial? just 
yeah, besides just the general whole food plant-based diet. So making sure you're not getting any animal protein, that's number one. And then making sure you're avoiding processed foods, that's number two, because they contain a lot of sodium and then not adding any sodium to your cooking or to your plate. So keeping your sodium low, keeping your blood pressure, which helps keep your blood pressure in good control, getting your exercise, getting your good sleep, kind of all the, everything in lifestyle medicine. But I'd say the big points would be no, no animal protein at all. And, and then avoiding the, the salt, added salt in the processed foods, which is where most of the salt is. I would, those would be the huge. And then, yeah, the night by eating lots of green leafies every day, like in the daily dozen, that increased nitric oxide is, will, will be helpful because it will dilate the, the blood vessels and keep your blood flowing nice and smooth. So that'll be helpful to you. Thank Good you. Good Thank thought. you so much. Thank you. Now, I do want to make a sidebar comment on the reducing sodium and salt in your diet. Um, some people take this very strictly and uh, stop all sodium and they wind up actually uh, not getting enough iodine in their diet if they're not eating sea vegetables um, and, or, and they're not using any iodized salt. And so I just had a patient this week actually who his um, TSH was elevating meaning his body was saying, hey, you're not producing enough thyroid. And yet, his, and his thyroid uh, hormone in his body was on the borderline of low. And I quizzed him about, Do you, are you getting any iodine? You're totally plant-based. He says, yeah, I'm totally plant-based. I don't get any salt or I don't know if I'm getting iodine or not. I said, well, why don't you add a little iodine? Let's do an experiment for a month add a, you know, like a quarter to a half a teaspoon of salt maximum for the whole day. Uh, Cause you're not getting it in any of the other food. You're not eating any processed food. He did that and both of his values returned to completely normal. So uh, he uh, just make sure as you're uh, keeping your salt level low uh, that you're, you're not eating salt. Um, that has no iodine in it, or, or that you're getting some sea vegetables with iodine, or that you take an iodine tablet supplement, something like that. Just a thought. Charlie, I had a time before, years back, where I did not eat any salt. And what happened, I could barely walk anymore. And they thought it was a, uh, in my head, something wrong. And all I needed was uh, get some Campbell's soup, had plenty of salt in it. I was fine. Next, next day, no, no more problem. So yeah. I missed a lot of salt. Apparently, I, I'm still missing a lot, but um, I'm just, barely making and not even making a half a teaspoon very very little salt over it you know so but i'm not fond of salt you know but right uh, um yeah i have to watch that otherwise i have you know i can't walk anymore and just you know things get wrong so yes. so you have to kind of think about how your body's reacting and the provider mm -hmm. who's uh consulting with you needs to take individual variation into consideration if we're talking yeah. about the majority of patients most of them can get by with little to no significant salt because they get a lot in their food um, but they're eating a lot of processed foods also so I don't we're not we're not <laughs> we're not yeah we're not doing that here sherry you had your hand up yeah <laughs> But I've had, had had a couple of times, and you know the Campbell soup with plenty of salt, and that next day I was fine. Okay. But I can't do that every day, no. <laughs> so someone says they use Celtic salt. Is there a difference between salt? Yes, there is difference. If it doesn't say there's iodine in it, you have to assume it's there's no iodine, and uh, you should probably switch to an iodized salt, something that says iodine in the salt. What kind of test could you do to see if you're getting enough iodine? Because I don't have, I don't eat any salt. 
I have never ordered an iodine level on anybody. Have you, Scott? No. <laughs> but usually, yeah. But usually, yeah, the thyroid would be the thing. If you're getting too much or too little, you're, it affects your thyroid. So, yeah. yeah. So, so if your thyroid function is otherwise normal, then you're probably getting adequate salt with iodine. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Sherry. Um, yes, I, I think tonight's class is on kidney. And uh, so if I may, I'm going to go off base here. Um, okay. You know, the, the, all the powders that are out there um, that you can mix with water or um, milk or juice or whatever, I think a lot of them are called protein powders, but um, there's been one that's come to my attention with my email. Um, is called, I think it's called Kachaba. I don't know how to pronounce it, um, but it says it's like, I don't know. I don't know how many fruits and vegetables and, and such in it. And, um, and I know that probably falls under a processed food, um, but I'm not sure because you mix it with water. And, um, and, I, and so is that not good for a person? Well, if it's, uh, all, if it's all plant protein, it should be fine as long as it's not uh, isolated or soy protein isolates. So you don't want anything that has soy protein isolate in it because that actually stimulates IGF-1, insulin-like growth factor 1, which is a cancer promoter. But all the other plant proteins are fine as long as it doesn't have any whey protein in it. A lot of protein supplements have whey protein and whey protein, W-H-E-Y, that's dairy. And so you don't want anything with any of that in there. We would just say, I mean, what's the what's the reason you're using the protein powder? Is it is there a I'm, reason you're using it? I'm not using it, but I'm okay. interested in using it. Um, I don't really like to cook, and um, so to take a spoonful of something and put it in water, um, you know, for breakfast or. Um, has appeal to me as long as it doesn't have any of all those um, other chemicals. And, and I've, I've read the ingredients, but I'm not a doctor or a scientist, I, um, but I don't see any of those really strange names. Um, okay. But there's a couple of things that they, are they vitamins? I don't, I don't know. Um, but they're really promoting it in in my realm um, because being um, whole plant based, and so yeah. that's why it even got my attention. I see. So so those things tend to be you know kind of expensive, and so we'd we'd rather you eat the fruits and vegetables, chew them because that would that's the healthier way to go. Or I would actually even put if you if that was not an option, I would just say you know making a smoothie with just whole foods would be better than spending the money on a, on a, even if it's a plant protein powder, just because you, you know, if you're just putting in, you know, lots of, you know, some frozen fruit and lots of green leafy vegetables and maybe a few dates to sweeten it, a little bit of oat milk or almond milk or something to, to uh, liquefy it a little bit or some ice cubes to thicken it up and you made a smoothie. And as long as you drank it slowly over about one to two hours, that would probably be, that I would prefer you, I would prefer that over using the protein powder just because it is expensive and, and uh, probably not, not necessary. And you want to you know, eat things as close to nature as, as possible, but it's probably not, it's not hard. I would, based on what you've said so far, I don't, I, I doubt it, it's harmful at all. It just tends to be expensive and maybe not the, be the best choice. And, and I do, I, and I heard you and, and I definitely accept that. Um, but making smoothies with the fruit or the vegetables, that's cooking to me. <laughs> and mm -hmm. and that, um, I, I will continue on and, and, um, and try my best to 
to make it from natural foods. But I thank you and I thank you both for all these classes. It's amazing. You're welcome. <laughs> so as you're thinking about cooking, uh, you have definitely an aversion to cooking. And I, I, I understand that because I could pretty much only boil water uh, 11 years ago before I started on this road. And it's been sort of like learning to play tennis or play the piano. It's been a work in progress and or learning a language. At first it was really awkward and I didn't really want to get near the stove or do any of that kind of cooking or chopping or anything really related to the kitchen. It seemed like a foreign event in my life. And then as I started doing it a little bit, I started to get a little better and a little better. And I watched another video and learned a little more science and got a little more excited when Gregor got excited about his what he was putting it, putting into his food bowl. And so I started experimenting a little bit like that. And it's been 10 years it's taken me to really get comfortable, but now I'll experiment with making tempeh uh, on my own, which is kind of a weird thing. Uh, like 12, 11, 12 years ago, I just said, there is no way you're ever gonna be making anything in your life. But now it's kind of fun and I feel good and I'm gonna be 74 tomorrow and I take no pills. And I say to myself, I am so happy that I, uh, you know, gradually allowed myself to kind of go with the flow and do something a bit different with my life. So that's what I would encourage you on that path. You don't have to do it tomorrow or in one day, but just have a thought process that says, you know, maybe I can kind of incorporate a little bit more of this if it's really going to allow me to reach the goal that I want for myself. Yeah. And, and, and through your through your class, I don't know how many, it's been a handful of months that I've been attending this. And I have learned that in on oatmeal, because I don't consider that cooking because I can put it in the microwave. Yeah. Um, um, that I can put, you know, fruit in there and um, oat milk, and I don't need sugar and and um, um, whole milk, which is what I've always used. Yeah, so um, you've come, so come a long way. I've and, changed, yes. And the same way with dinner now. The, <laughs> the potato goes in the bowl, goes in the microwave. It's not right. cooking. And, right. and you heat it up, you cut it open with a knife. That's not a lot That's of cooking. Yeah. And then you crack a can open and you put in some beans, a half a can and put in a little salsa that you bought at the store, that's not cooking, and then add some greens, it's not cooking, you just kind of pull them off, and then eat a piece of fruit, and you know, you have dinner and lunch that way. You know, I mean, there are different ways to think about this, so try to make it easy for yourself. Uh, I'm trying and I'm hanging in here, so. Well, again, good for you. And, yeah. And ha a happy upcoming birthday, too. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, Charlie. Yeah, <laughs> yeah 74, actually. It, and it sounds like a big number. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't quite feel that 74. You know, when I'm on the tennis court or the pickleball court, and the people across the net are getting huffing and puffing and out of breath, uh, I'm feeling pretty young about that time, but the number sounds pretty old. <laughs> I, I hear you. I'm only three years behind you, so okay. I hear you. All right. Well, keep at it. And if you want a fun activity, pickleball is really a good one. It's not a stress on the shoulder. It's really a fun social event, and it's really coming into its own here. Okay. Uh, for those of you who just want to do a little more activity. Tell me how you do that. Yeah, so pickleball, you have a paddle. It's like the um, a little bit bigger than a ping pong paddle, maybe twice the size. And then you have a ball, which is like a wiffle ball. I don't know if you remember wiffle balls that you I hit with a bat. They're, yes. a, 
A wiffle ball is a plastic ball. It's about the size of a baseball, but it's plastic. So uh -huh. if it hits you, it doesn't hurt you. Mm -hmm. uh, and you just hit this ball uh, across the net like you're playing tennis or ping pong. And you can play singles, you can play doubles, and it's fun. And the courts are uh, open all day long, free uh, at, um, uh, on Springfield. It's um, on uh, H Street. Uh, I can't remember the name of the park. Mill and H Street. And uh, it starts at 8.30 in the morning, and you can go down, and people will share a paddle with you sometimes and uh, teach you how to do it. You know, I just got yesterday 10,000 steps in and my, my watch said, hooray, got the whole thing. I get plenty of exercise. I don't know how. <laughs> if, you, if you did that, then that's good. I would, I'd be happy with that. And if you need more, then you'll take up pickleball. Just depends on how you're feeling. I don't have time to go. I'm living close to the airport. That's too far for me to go. <laughs> it is a, a way, I agree. So um, yeah, I have a question. Um, I like sweets, so I've been eating dates. Is that okay, or is it too much sugar? How much? How many dates are you eating? Um, maybe like four to six. Um, you know, four to six dates in my mind seems like not an unreasonable amount. Uh, it's a whole food. Um. A uh, are you eating other fruit? Yeah, yeah. How many other servings a day are you eating? Um, well, I- Apples, eat, bananas, uh, oranges. Like ap apple, pears, um, mango. Um, I think that's about it. Okay, so if you're eating four servings of fruit a day, I would say uh, four dates is probably a serving in my mind. I don't know what Gregor says, uh, okay. but um, four to five is probably not an unreasonable amount. Some dates are bigger and some are smaller. So if, if they're <laughs> small dates, six would be fine. If they're huge dates, I'd stick with the four. <laughs> Thank you. I needed that. I, I did the same problem. <laughs> okay. Any comments from you, Scott, yeah. on that date okay. issue? Oh, just if you're trying to lose weight, you, you, you generally want to avoid dried fruit because it's just so much higher in calorie density. But if you're trying to maintain weight or gain weight, then dried fruit's a, a great choice. Okay. Can you Anybody else? Ken, yeah. we, haven't, we haven't heard from you for a while. Well, I've been here, and if I'm not here, then I'm watching it after the fact. Okay, um, good to see you. So the, thank you. The, um, we've heard about date flour, I mean date sugar. Sugar. Uh, ground up dates, and I kind of was looking for some, I haven't found any yet. Um, so, you know, you kind of look for sugar substitutes. So I use raisins, chopped up dates. Um, but I, I, do you know anything? I mean, is it okay? Tell me about this uh, date flour. I can't find or date sugar. I can't find it. And I don't even know if I should use it, whatever I get it. Um. I don't know if Christine has used that in recipes before when we were first transitioning. She doesn't use a lot of it now, I don't think. Uh, it's sort of like a blast of sugar, <laughs> you know, kind of, you know, disrupts the sweetness that you get from an apple or from an or orange or uh, grapes are pretty sweet. I think if you need a little extra sweetness in your life, having the date, eating the date itself is probably the healthiest. But if if you're doing a little taste with a little date sugar, I don't know, you could get it off of Amazon. It's probably in the markets also. I think or, I've seen it at Market of Choice. Or, or chop it, just chop up some dates. Chopping yeah, up dates is the healthiest. Can we? Go back to kidneys just a minute. Yeah, we can go back. 
So on my uh, panels for like the last four years, they it says the same thing in every every year, greater than 60. So that just means uh, I don't have any kidney problems. Is that right? Uh, unless you were spilling protein in your urine. If you were spilling um, albumin or protein in your urine, if your urinalysis showed that, then you potentially could have, be having some early kidney problems. But if your GFR is above 60, you generally are, pr are pretty good. The other values are the B1 and creatinine. Uh, as long as they're normal on your chemistry panel, that's, those are the other two uh, kidney function tests that we look at closely. B1 and creatinine. Yeah, there's a lot to know when you start looking at these blood tests and Scott told me to quit worrying so much about them and um, I, I am kind of obsessing over them. But well, then stop it. Um, <laughs> it's, and that's what Esselstyn told me when I told him I was obsessing about the amount of protein I was getting. I said, I'm counting and I don't think I'm getting enough protein here. I count up every day and it's not enough. And, and he said to me, nine years ago or 10 years ago. Hey, how many people have you diagnosed with protein deficiency? I said, none. He says, well, stop counting. And I stopped <laughs> counting on his advice and I've been happy. I, I don't waste my time worrying about things that I didn't have to worry about. I'm, I'm just so <laughs> impressed and happy that for the last three years, my A1C is steadily, um, going the direction it's supposed to. So it was about 5.8 and now we're down to 5.4 and some of that, well, definitely going from 5.5 to 5.4 is because of this lifestyle. So you should focus on that. How well, I, fortunate. I kind of, of want to find <laughs> I I mean, like, it in other places. Yeah, so you don't have to look for another problem to worry about and keep you upset. You can focus on the things that bring you joy and that are positive in your life, and it'll be um, lead you to a much healthier state of mind. Just my thought. Okay, I'm gonna give you guys a break, but I've got more questions later. <laughs> okay. I haven't answered, asked any questions for four weeks. It's been a while, so it's good to hear from you. Thanks. All right, I, I wanna play a video for you all on kidney issues and then we'll get a, back i have a question real quick go ahead has anybody is pretend to salt has anybody tried black salt um no black no, salt there there is a there is a salt i don't know if it's a black salt there is a salt that tastes like rotten eggs that uh um, yeah I think that might be what you're talking about. It's not it rotten is. eggs. It has a smell like eggs, not rotten eggs, but eggs. And you, if you put a little of that in the tofu, you get like a egg scramble, like make tofu with potatoes and adding that black salt. Um, masala, I think is the name of it. I don't know, can't recall exactly. Can give you a I kind of an egg, that. an egg flavor. Yeah, I found a recipe that uses it, so I ordered it, and I just wondering if anybody had used it. We've and used it. Christine has used it, and it's uh, it's actually pretty good if you like eggs. Yeah, <laughs> okay. I do. Okay, well All then, right. you use it and tell us about it. Okay. All right. Uh, so I'm going to kind of share the screen one more time. We're going to kind of, we just have a couple videos on kidney issues. Let's see if I can uh, find where we're at. We're right here. How to treat kidney stones diet, treating chronic kidney disease with food, and how to treat heart failure and kidney failure with diet. So let's do these two on treating chronic kidney disease with food. 
and treating heart failure. Uh, those two, and then if you we have time, we can do the kidney stones, but let's do this first. In the United States, approximately one in three adults aged 65 and older have chronic kidney disease. But the majority of patients with chronic kidney disease do not progress to the advanced stages because death precedes the progression to end-stage renal disease. Following about 1,000 folks 65 years or older with chronic kidney disease for about a decade, only a few had to go on dialysis because most had to go underground. Uh, the scariest thing for many kidney patients is the fear of dialysis, but they may be 13 times more likely to die than dialysis, with deaths from heart disease killing more than nearly all other causes combined. Decreasing kidney function can just set one up for heart attack, strokes, and death. That's why it's critical that any diet chosen to help the kidneys must also help the heart, and a plant-based diet fits the bill, providing protection against kidney cancer, and kidney stones, and kidney inflammation, and acidosis, as well as heart disease, uh, namely blood pressure control may be favored by the reduction of sodium intake, and the vegetarian nature of the diet, which is very important also for lowering serum cholesterol, which may not only help the heart, but the kidneys themselves. All the way back in 1858, Verkau, the father of modern pathology, was the first to describe the fatty degeneration of the kidney. In 1982, this idea of lipid nephrotoxicity was formalized. The possibility that fat and cholesterol in the bloodstream could be toxic to the kidneys directly, and based on data like this, showing plugs of fat literally kind of clogging up the works in autopsied kidneys. Since the notion was put forth, it has gained momentum. It appears high cholesterol and fat in the blood may accelerate progression of chronic kidney disease through direct toxic effects on the kidney cells themselves. Given the connection between cholesterol and kidney decline, the use of cholesterol-lowering statin drugs has been recommended to slow the progression of kidney disease. Of course, serious adverse effects on muscle and liver must be kept in mind. That's why plant-based diets could offer the best of both worlds, protecting the heart and the kidneys without drug side effects. The two potential drawbacks are the amount of phosphorus and potassium in plant foods, which ailing kidneys can sometimes have a problem getting rid of. But it turns out that the phosphorus in meat is absorbed at about twice the rate, uh, not to mention the phosphate additives that are injected into meat. So eating vegetarian can significantly lower phosphorus levels in the blood. The concern about potassium is largely theoretical, since the alkalizing effects of plant foods help the body excrete potassium, but not theoretical for those on dialysis or with end-stage disease who need to be followed closely by a dietitian kidney specialist. Special protein-restricted vegan diets have been used successfully to slow or stop the progression of kidney failure. Here is the declining kidney function of eight diabetics for one to two years before switching to a plant-based diet, which appeared to stop the inexorable decline in most of the patients, leading the researchers to proclaim it is the treatment of choice for a diabetic kidney failure. It may also help delay dialysis by one to two years, and after a kidney transplant may improve the survival of the kidney and improve the survival of the patient, most of the papers, though, are just pilot feasibility studies. It doesn't matter if it's effective if we can't get people to stick to the diet. But while we're waiting for more definitive studies, existing data support offering these kinds of plant-based diets as an option to all patients with advanced or progressive chronic kidney disease. Even if the effects of such diets on the progression of kidney failure are still debatable, the unquestionably favorable effects of plant, uh, beneficial favorable effects on uh, plant-based diets and some of the most deleterious cardiovascular and metabolic disorders 
usually associated with renal failure, like hypertension, diabetes, provide rationale for recommending a predominance of plant proteins for patients with failing kidneys. Yet, diet is still underutilized, in part because some people find changing their diet is difficult. Yet we know foods rich in animal protein lead to metabolic acidosis. Our diets are largely acid-producing because they are deficient in fruits and vegetables and contain large amounts of animal products. And so what did doctors do? They gave people baking soda. Instead of treating the cause, the dietary acid load, from too many animal products, too few fruits and vegetables, they treated the consequence by saying, oh, too much acid? Well, we'll just give you some base of sodium bicarbonate. And it works. Uh, neutralization of dietary acid with sodium bicarb decreases kidney failure and slows uh, you know, kidney function decline, but uh, sodium bicarbonate baking soda has sodium, so doctors may just be adding another problem. Now, if patients are not going to cut back on animal products, at least they should uh, be eating more fruits and vegetables. And so they tried that, and look, it worked too, and with it doing so without leading to too much potassium in the blood. And it may work even better, as fruits and vegetables have the additional advantage of helping to lower blood pressure. And this study is important because it illustrates a very simple and safe way to treat metabolic acidosis, fruits and vegetables. So the key to halting the progression of chronic kidney disease might be in the produce market, not in the pharmacy. What you, can you do to uh, you know, prevent further progression of kidney disease? More fruits and vegetables. Let's go to the last video here, how to treat heart failure and kidney failure with diet. One way a diet rich in animal-sourced foods, meat, eggs, and cheese, may contribute to heart disease, stroke, and death is through the production of an atherosclerosis-inducing substance called TMAO. And with the help of certain gut bacteria, the choline and carnitine found concentrated in animal products can get converted into TMAO. But wait a second, I thought atherosclerosis, hardening of the arteries, was about the buildup of cholesterol. Cholesterol is still king. TMAO just appears to accelerate the process. TMAO appears to increase the ability of inflammatory cells within the atherosclerotic plaque in the artery wall to bind to LDL cholesterol, which makes it more prone to gobble up that cholesterol. So it's just a, another piece of the puzzle of how cholesterol causes heart disease. And TMAO doesn't just appear to worsen atherosclerosis, contributing to strokes and heart attacks, but also heart failure and kidney failure. If you look at a really high-risk group, like diabetics after a heart attack, nearly all those who started out with the most TMAO in their bloodstream went on to develop heart failure within 2,000 days, about five years. Whereas only about 20% of those starting out with medium levels in the blood went into heart failure, and none in the low TMAO group. Not only do those with heart failure have higher levels of TMAO than controls, and those with worse heart failure have higher levels than those with lesser stage disease, if you follow people with heart failure over time, Within six years, half of those who started out with the highest levels were dead. This finding has since been replicated in two other independent populations of heart failure patients. The question is why? It's probably unlikely to just be additional atherosclerosis, since that takes years. For most of those that die of heart failure, the heart muscle just conks out, or there's a fatal heart rhythm. So maybe. TMAO has toxic effects beyond just the accelerated buildup of cholesterol. What about kidney failure? People with chronic kidney disease are at particularly increased risk for the development of cardiovascular disease, thought to be because of a diverse array of uremic toxins. These are toxins that would normally be filtered out by the kidneys into the urine, 
but may build up in the bloodstream as our kidney function declines. When we think of uremic toxins, we usually think of the toxic byproducts of protein putrefying in our gut, which is why specially formulated plant-based diets have been used for decades to treat chronic kidney failure. Those who eat vegetarian form less than half of these uremic toxins in the first place. But those aren't the only uremic toxins. TMAO, from the breakdown of choline and carnitine in mostly meat and eggs, may be increasing heart disease risk in kidney patients as well, by apparently downregulating reverse cholesterol transport, meaning subverting our own body's attempt at pulling cholesterol out of our arteries. And indeed, the worse our kidney function gets, the higher our TMAO levels rise, and those elevated levels correlate with the amount of plaque they have clogging up the arteries in their heart. But get a kidney transplant, get a working kidney going, and you can drop your TMAO levels right back down. So TMAO was thought to be kind of a biomarker for declining kidney function. But then this study was published from the Framingham Heart Study, which found that elevated choline and TMAO levels among individuals with normal kidney function predicted increased risk for developing chronic kidney disease, suggesting TMAO is both a biomarker and itself a kidney toxin. Indeed, when you follow kidney patients over time and assess their freedom from death, those with higher TMAO, even controlling for kidney function, live significantly shorter lives indicating this diet-induced mechanism for progressive kidney scarring and dysfunction, strongly implying the need to focus preventative efforts on like dietary modification. What might that look like? Well, maybe we should reduce dietary sources of TMAO generation, such as some species of deep-sea fish, eggs, and meat. But it also depends on what kind of gut bacteria you have. Remember, you can feed a vegan a steak, and they still don't really make any TMAO because they haven't been fostering the carnitine-eating bacteria in their gut. Researchers are hoping, however, that one day they'll find a way to replicate the effects of a vegetarian diet by selective prebiotic, probiotic, or antibiotic therapy. You can wait around until science finds a pill, or you can change your diet and actually eat healthy and don't produce TMAO. So I know that had a lot of verbiage in there, which may have tested a few of you, but bottom line is, you know, heart disease, kidney disease are pretty closely related for various reasons. And I hope you got the point. If you don't want TMAO in your world, you're going to be eating less uh, meat and eggs. Just a thought. How about you, Scott? Any other words of yeah, wisdom? Da yeah, dairy also has uh, choline in it too. So cheese and milk also contain choline. So, so it's pretty much any, any meat, dairy, and eggs will also elevate TMAO levels. There is so much science. Every week we hear some new science from Gregor or Bernard or someone, and it's just overwhelming. It's like, how can people not, if they would take the time and listen to some of this, not make changes? But the problem is, is they don't seem to have the time to take, to actually listen to a different point a view than what their medical training has provided for them. Oh yeah, another little tidbit I learned yesterday. Eric Eric talked to Dr. Gregor yesterday, and uh, at the conference, and actually he has so he has seventeen on his paid staff that do the that do the final evaluation of all the studies and helping to make the videos and things like that. But there's actually two hundred volunteers that are trained on on researching the science. And have gone through his his training, and uh, so they actually, so as far as reviewing a hundred thousand studies a year, there's actually two hundred people that help do that. 
So wow. it kind of gets funneled from 200 people down to the 17 paid staff, and then then they have the more intensive evaluation of the of the data. So yeah, pretty pretty cool. Wow, very interesting. So, anybody have any other thoughts? Uh, we can go back to kidney disease, but let's skip back to uh, lifestyle medicine issues that Scott talked about. And remember, what you eat, how you move, the chemicals you choose, how you deal with stress, including or also your sleep habits and your social connections, all of those are really important to bringing you health or resulting in disease if you don't uh, you know, address those issues. I have a question. Yes. Uh, what is the difference between choline with a K and I have C-H-O-L-I-N-E, choline. What's the difference? Is that the same stuff? Yeah, the choline he's talking about there is the C-H-O-L-I-N-E, choline and then carnitine. L-carnitine is C-A-R-N-I-T-I-D-I-N-E. So L-carnitine is in mainly uh, meat, mainly red meat. And then uh, choline is in white, like poultry, fish, also in uh, cheese and other dairy products. No, I take a pill and it's called C-H-O-L-I-N-E. Yeah, that's choline. It's the same thing? <laughs> Uh, you might not want to take it after tonight. Well, I have two of them. Oh, my word. <laughs> but, but the other thing to think about is if you're not eating any animal products, you're not going to have the bacteria in your gut that are going to turn choline into TMAO. So you're so if you I mean, yeah, we would say don't you don't need to be eating choline supplements. But, you know, if, if you if you're taking a, a supplement and you're not eating any animal products, you're probably not going to be making any any TMAO because you don't you don't have the, the bacteria in your colon that do the conversion. It says brain health. I thought that was different. It's the same thing, huh? It's the same thing. Oh my goodness. And I got two bottles. <laughs> <laughs> have to well, bring we're, it we're... Back. As you probably know from now, we're not big fans of supplements of most any kind, except for B12 yeah, and I'm maybe vitamin D. I'm reading now a book and it, it tells me very similar things. Yeah. I'm, I'm slowing down on the supplement. Any attack on a minority group. We better, we better mute everybody. <laughs> yeah. We might so, almost say that Nazi savagery against the Jew is a strong. Let's see. I'll go ahead and mute everybody because there's just too many here. Oh. Okay. There we go. Now, if you kind of unmute yourself, you can mute yourself again if you need to speak up. And that way we won't have. Uh, too much background noise. Anybody else? So um, this is Linda. Linda, Hello, Hamilton. Linda. I, I, I'm I, I'm so thankful for this. This I haven't been on able to get on a lot, but I missed two meetings tonight just to get to this, and I'm glad because you're talking about kidney, and I'm okay. glad of what I'm listening to, but. Um, uh, the plant base. Um, what what what's the most? What are you? I'm trying to figure out good protein. I'm in transition, I call it, and every now and then I relapse on chicken. Uh, but what's a good plant based protein? Not not the protein powder shakes and all that stuff. Um, Scott, do you want to talk about yeah, that? Yeah, yeah, sure. So so. If you get, as long as you're getting enough calories, you're always going to get enough protein. So there's not, protein's not a nutrient of concern. The nutrient okay. concern is actually fiber. But if you, if you're new, fairly new to the classes, we recommend you go onto the class website, go back to the class archives for, for the beginning of this year and watch my introduction and Charlie's introduction. And then the third class is uh, meal planning. And then even okay. if you look a little bit further into the year, like I think it was in 
might have been February. February or March, I have the class on nutritional myths and other popular diets. And that's a good one to watch just to, if you're confused about protein and getting enough of certain nutrients, that's a good one to watch. Um, but yeah, but, but definitely feel free to ask any questions you have. Okay. I'll, I'll go back and watch those. And I have a neighbor that's very interested too. I told her about this, this uh, Tuesday night meeting. So she's going to join, but thank you guys so much for helping educate those who are battling a lot of these diseases. Yeah, and Linda, if you need some extra one-on-one -on -one time, all you need to do is uh, send a little email to me and either I'll talk with you or hook you up with one of the med students and can help uh, talk you through some of the issues that you may have questions. It's Katanya Ross at msn.com is an email address. I put it in the chat room. And uh, you could just send it along like, hey, I need a little extra help. Send your phone number. We'll give you a call. And, um, you know, if you're having trouble finding things on the website that you're interested in, we want to help you in whatever way we can. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. You're welcome. Yeah, I have two questions. Uh, is there any problem with uh, milling flax for like a, a week's supply as long as you keep it in the fridge? No. Okay. It's a uh, it's a good strategy if you like to do that. Okay. Yeah, it, it, it will usually last for up to a month in the refrigerator. So you could buy flax meal and that would last a month. The flax seeds that we buy, we keep on the counter and they'll last for months and we just take a tablespoon or whatever it is a uh, piece out uh, every day and grind it because we've got a nut grinder. But if it works for you to do several days, do it. Okay. Uh, you know, my A1, since going on to plant-based, my A1C has gone to 5.9 to 5.4. My LDL has gone from like the 90s down last time was 64. Wow. Uh, my triglycerides have gone up. Uh, you know, I, I have not been exercising the way I was because I've been having some balance issue and maybe that's that's why I was doing a lot of extensive cycling. Um, is there any other reason that I might, my triglycerides might go up? How high did they go up? Uh, 50 points, 70 points? Uh, I thought I wrote it down. It, it went, went from like, uh, low 50s to uh, like mid 90s, I think it was. That's don't normal. lose, don't lose a minute of sleep tonight okay. or any other night. Okay, it's, you are still it, it, in the normal yeah. range. Yeah, and it, it is yeah. absolutely nothing to concern yourself with. Okay, the third thing I want to mention <laughs> is Dr. Greger. I think he's a fan of Bob Newhart. I was going to recommend you Google Bob Newhart's routine on stop it he's a stop it he's a shrink talking to somebody has problems and that's his response is stop it <laughs> i have seen that before yeah it's hilarious I, I, so i that's sort of how i came to the conclusion is stop uh, <laughs> ruminating about this you know i mean i uh, i it, it is quite funny Thanks for reminding us about that. Okay. That's it. Thank you. Well, that, thank, thank you. What's that uh, stand or the range we want to have the triglycerides? It want to be below 150, but but it's not usually a problem unless it's like over two or three hundred. But but most people, it's mostly genetic for most people. But but when it's elevated, if it's greater than 150, but the things that raise it the most are oily fried foods, refined white sugar, white flour, and alcohol. So you just, you know, the way we're teaching to eat here usually isn't a problem. There's a few people that do get a little bit elevated with even fruit, but it's really rare, but that can happen. So, uh, but again, if it's, you know, not over like 200, or 300, it's not, it's not an issue. It's not an independent risk factor for anything. Only when it's over like three or 400 just can it cause some problems. But yeah, if it's what, below 150, you're good. But if it is above 150, 
and you're kind of worried about it, then just, you know, make sure you're not eating any white flour, white sugar, alcohol, and like things like fruit juice. And then of course, oily or fried foods, even if it's, you know, if you're going to cornbread cafe and eating fried vegan food, that's, that's not, not your friend. So. And don't worry about it. It's a minimal risk factor in comparison to other risk factors that you're decreasing. All right, someone else must have a question. I see Lisa Chick put in her information. She's one of the medical students or the medical student at this time who's doing counseling. She's had quite a bit of experience at it. And uh, she was, uh, would be able to help you out. You can contact her directly, or like I say, you can contact me and I'll hook you up with her, whatever. Any other questions? So, <clears throat> Charlie, I wanted to say to uh, Linda that an easy way to get protein, just a quick, so she doesn't have to look at all the programs, is um, beans and legumes and tofu and tempeh. But the problem with tofu and tempeh is they don't really have um, fiber, right? Uh, they do. They, they do? do. Because yeah. when I see the, like on Instagram, they show how to make tofu from chickpeas and different things and lentils and they strain it. So I thought if you strain that kind of stuff, then there goes the outer casing of the, the bean and then you probably wouldn't have the fiber so much. Um, I was, I, so I'm asking about, about the tofu and the, the fiber will, in tofu. I'll do a quick Google search and we'll find out how much fiber is in tofu. Yeah, because a, a half, uh, half cup of soybeans would be, should be seven grams of fiber. Because in general, beans have seven grams of fiber per half cup serving. And so we'd have to see if, yeah, edamame would be the whole soybean, whether it's, a, I know black beans are a little higher in fiber than, than some of the other beans, for example. But, um, but yeah, but yeah, eating, eat, you're just like uh, she said, beans are, are your, are your protein winners there as far as, as far as the amounts. But, but again, we don't want people to count, just like Charlie said earlier, we don't need to be counting how many grams of protein we're getting and things like that. Just as long as you're eating a wide variety of foods, getting enough calories, you're gonna be getting enough protein. So here's one source that says, tofu has fiber and high fiber diets keep your colon healthy and cancer. Um, I just don't see anything about the, um, amount of fiber in tofu. My but guess Scott, is it's probably a slightly less probably because it's been minimally processed. So here is one that says it's 0.4 grams in a in a what half a cup. That well, if I look at the, if I look at the packaging it says it's minus one gram. <laughs> so it seems to me that the fiber in tofu is obviously is not as good as having the whole bean. It obviously is not, but it, I don't think it would be as low as minus one. <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> because it's three percent of the of the daily uh, requirement. So that's not very. That's not. That's a lot not very much in comparison. You're you're right. Apparently, uh, if it's only 3%, that would not be a high fiber food that it gets stripped away, but it yeah, has other nutrients. It has the protein and I guess a bit of fat in tofu. Yeah, and, and, and Doris wrote that uh, tempeh has seven grams for three ounces, which makes sense because tempeh has the whole, the whole soybean in it. Yeah, mm -hmm. so that makes sense. So we do talk about and mommy being the healthiest choice, then tempeh being the next, and then, or miso soup, or miso, and then um, tofu being, being the least healthy, but still a healthy food. So thanks for bringing that to our attention, that tofu, if you're really looking for more fiber, is not going to provide you much bang for your buck compared to eating whole beans of, or lentils but it's still a healthy food and it may uh, prevent 
breast cancer recurrence and improve longevity if uh, one has had breast cancer. So if people like tofu and I like it, I'm going to keep eating it, even if it has a little less fiber. I have a question. How about spirulina? Is that uh, good for protein? Um, you know, spinach has 40% protein and spirulina is a dark green. Um, it's an algae. Algae. Uh, so I don't know how much protein is in that. Um, I guess a Google search would show how much fiber in spirulina. Can you check that out? Uh, I yeah, I... I, I've got my, I don't know how to spell spirulina, but it's S-P-I-R, here it is, Spir, spirulina, S-P-I-R-U-L-I-N-A. It has yeah. uh, dietary fiber is 0.4, it's a 1%. It, it's about the same as tofu for a serving. No, no I'm talking about uh, protein. Oh, a protein, it says it's uh, carbohydrate, sodium, fiber, it doesn't really list a lot of protein on there. It doesn't show any? Oh, wait. Spirulina powder is uh, 18 carbs, 66 grams of protein. That's a lot. A lot of yeah, protein? It's, yeah, it looks like it's high, high in protein. And it's a plant food, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Would you recommend it then? I haven't take spot, taken spirulina. <laughs> I don't. I don't know. <laughs> I, if it's a sea vegetable, it it may be healthy. Have you eaten spirulina, Scott? No, I haven't. I'm sure. I think there's a. I think Gregor has a video on it, but I don't. I don't uh, recall too much about it. It's a. It's a in a capsule. I'd, I'd say it's one thing that if you wanted to supplement with some spirulina occasionally, it's probably okay. That's what I do. Yeah, not every day, no. But you should avoid spirulina if you take blood thinners like Coumadin, uh, have bleeding disorder, allergies, or PKU. Does it thin out the blood? Uh, have an autoimmune... I think it might. Uh, does it block B12? Uh, what? It does block B12? Uh, no. Uh, let's see. Spirulina harvest in the wild. Oh, Gregor had the video, and, and he, I think, in his video said it may be contaminated with heavy metals and bacteria in high amounts. Oh. oh. <laughs> And it's a not a regulated supplement. There is not enough research to suggest blue-green algae is safe for pregnant or breastfeeding women. So that, that was his concern, as I recall, that he wasn't encouraging people to take spirulina because of the potential contaminants. Oh, wow. I'm going to have to read that if that's contaminated or not. Yeah, just do a Google search and you'll find it. Yeah, they probably don't put it on the bottle. No, they want to sell their product. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, even better is to do a search on nutrition facts rather than Google, just because you're going to get yeah. the, the better science when you get with nutrition facts rather than just Google. Excellent Google. idea. Someone says, what's your favorite way of preparing tofu? And I'm going to tell you how my wife makes it is my favorite way. She just chops up uh, uh, firm tofu or extra firm, usually it's firm right at this point in our life, uh, into little cubes, one inch cubes. She, she um, in a plastic bag, she puts in some liquid uh, or coconut aminos. It's a liquid kind of sauce. Um, and then uh, some nutritional yeast and then she may put in some curry or she may put in a different spice like an Asian spice or a, a Mexican spice. And she just puts the tofu in there and shakes it all up together and then air fries it. And it's my mouth is watering. 
That's all I can tell you. Yeah, it's quite tasty. So remember, nutritional yeast with uh, maybe some coconut aminos, and you can get different amounts of sodium in the coconut amino. Uh, some are really high in sodium, some are low. So try to find the low in salt or sodium. Yeah, in general, coconut aminos are lower in salt than liquid aminos. And actually, we have, we get the coconut aminos at Costco. They have big bottles of it. It's pretty uh, pretty cost effective there. Okay. So anybody else? When we're talking about fiber, I think it was probably discussed when we talked about labels, but fiber on labels comes two ways. There's um, soluble fiber and insoluble fiber. So which one's best or, uh, or what's the difference? Yes, they're both. <laughs> they're both. Good. Go ahead. Yeah. Oh, as I say, every, all all foods have a mixture of both soluble and insoluble. So it's you don't really need to worry. That's another thing not to worry about. You'll just just look at the how much fiber and try not to eat foods with a label for the most part, and uh, <laughs> and follow the rules of the food label reading class, and and just eat lots of fiber. We, yeah, we could go into the details of both, and Charlie talks about it in the fiber class a little bit, but soluble fiber is you know, mostly in beans and grains and things like that. And then in, so that kind of pulls fluid in and kind of um, it, it's kind of gel gels up the causes a jelly like substance pulls fluid into the colon, whereas insoluble fiber just kind of bulks the stool. I don't know, that's just the simplest way to ex explain it. But And then I'll give you a little additional uh, oatmeal is soluble and it hooks up with cholesterol and acts like a wheelbarrow and wheelbarrows it right out of your intestine. It does the same with excess estrogen or excess testosterone or whatever it might be, some hormones uh, and with some other things. So the soluble, like uh, Scott said, forms kind of a gel and it hooks up and it gets rid of uh, these excess um, chemicals you don't want. And uh, the um, insoluble is food for what? Your microbiome. That's what your bacteria are eating. They love that. And what are the microbiome? If you feed your microbiome, those bacteria food, they feed you back. What do they feed you back? They feed you back serotonin. They feed you back butyrate, which is uh, anti-inflammatory. So you want to be feeding your bacteria those microbiome insoluble, and you also want want to get some soluble fiber. And so don't stress over it. Just eat the foods that have fiber, and you'll get a little of both from most everything. And then a quick question about miso. You mentioned miso quite often. Yeah. And I may use the wrong miso. Uh, I love this stuff, and I I eat a lot of soup. I make a lot of soup, and I love to put this in the soup because it makes them salty. So this this brand I have in my hand is uh, it's, it's salty. I mean, you just know it is when you taste it. But it says per um, two teaspoons has uh, 410 milligrams of salt. Okay, so you can have up to 1500 milligrams of salt a day. So two teaspoons is only 400. So if you're not uh, dumping a bunch of other salt at yourself, then you're, you're fine. You know, you can eat uh, quite a bit of miso throughout the day. And if you listen to Gregor, uh, the amount of sodium, for some reason, uh, doesn't seem to be as harmful as with other foods. Thanks. I've always got more questions, but I'll give you a break again. <laughs> okay. Uh, anybody else? Gosh, it's 8.30 already. 
how time <laughs> flies when you're having fun. My arms are a little achy. What are they achy from? The COVID and the flu shot from yesterday. Oh. We got them both. And uh, we woke up this morning and we were a little achy, Christine and I, and we said, oh, we're kind of achy, you know? And I said, you know, we're kind of half awake. I think if we get up and we just move around. So we went for a walk and we kind of forgot about it. And now it's getting to be night and the achiness comes back a little bit. Tough to get older. <laughs> <laughs> and then just, uh, just a reminder, our, uh... Our fourth and final Eugene plant-based provider walk is this coming Saturday. So Saturday the 24th at 11 o'clock, that's coming up. And then next Tuesday's class is on fasting. And Charlie has lots of good videos for that, for the fasting class. And, I'll, and on the website, I'll show everybody the, the fasting infographic that Dr. Greger put out. I have it up on the website, but I'll show everybody that before, class, before Charlie gets started with class. But yeah, hopefully I, we see a bunch of you out at the walk on this coming Saturday over by Valley River at the bike bridge. So that's the one we did the first time, right? No, we're doing, it's, a, it's been the same one, three, three walks in a row now. This is the third one in a row at the same place. It's, it's all at the same place? Yeah, yeah. So you go where those buses were when they were busing people or whatever? Yep, yep right, the Greenway bike bridge right there. Okay, sounds good. I plan on seeing you there going to play tennis from 8 to 9 30 first okay <laughs> <laughs> but we're coming good anybody else yay nay all right it's been fun with you all and um scott thank you very much happy birthday yeah, yeah happy thank birthday you. tomorrow happy charlie. birthday charlie thank you have very much one. Okay. Oh, happy birthday, Charlie. It's been fun with you all. Happy birthday, Charlie. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you, Charlie. Happy birthday to you and many more. On channel four. <laughs> oh, that's pretty funny. Okay, thank Bye. you. You made my day. Is 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 Jen still here? Because she had a last minute question about the walk. Are yeah, still here, Jen. I'm here. Oh yeah. So just go on to the. Uh, it, it, do you know how to get to the class website? Yes. And then, have you seen the Eugene Plant Based Providers uh, link to that website off the homepage? I haven't, but I will go digging here, around. Let, here, let me show you real quick if you're still here. You can, can you see my can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. So let me go up here. Here's the Thank home you. page of the website. And so here's the uh, Eugene plant based providers right here. So you can either click oh. here, here, and okay. then then you're on the Eugene plant based providers website, which is loading here. And then look at upcoming events right here. Okay. Click on that. And then this was the conference I just attended. And here's our next walk right here is the information. Oh, and, very cool. And always keep up with uh, the upcoming events on, we'll always post stuff here that's happening in the community. And so you can come to the walk. Here it is the Saturday, the 24th, 11 o'clock. Here's the map. And then uh, of course we have the wellness expo coming up in October. You can come check us out there. We're gonna have a booth there at the Lane County Fairgrounds. And we'll just always keep uh, different, uh, events that are free in the community uh, on that on that website under upcoming events. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks for sharing that with us, Don. Yeah, Happy sure. birthday, Charlie. Thank you. Take care, everybody. All right, bye. Until the next too. time. Bye-bye.